But not all microwaves are that energetic that they can cook things. Mobile phones, for example, use about five thousandths of a watt. It's a very small amount. When you're talking on them, however, they might use 0.35 of a watt. A laptop, to give you some sort of reference of what a watt is, uses about 50 watts. So that's probably somewhere around 100 times the energy of your mobile phone uses when you're on the phone. And probably somewhere along the lines of 10,000 times the energy when your mobile phone's just sitting in your pocket. Household lamps use around the same energy as a laptop. A TV might use about 300 watts. A toaster, much more energetic at 600 watts. And a microwave oven, around 800 watts. So you can see there is a distinct difference between a microwave oven next to your head and a mobile phone. Around the late 90s, however, many people weren't too sure of this knowledge and they thought that mobile phones posed a very serious health risk. Many people would choose to use the Alara principle when using a mobile phone at the time. They would choose to keep the risk of damaging the cell as small as possible, or in this instance, as low as reasonably achievable. That's what Alara stands for. In a situation where there might be some danger, you will try not to do it more than you will need to do it. You will try and restrict your usage, or you will try and reduce your usage so that any risk or any harm could be minimised. With mobile phones, for example, people would not keep mobile phones in their pockets, they would keep them in their bags. They would only use them to make phone calls when is necessary and try and use a home phone at any other time. People would also invest in hands-free kits so that when they are on the mobile phone, it is not next to their head. Some, however, took the other option, which was to avoid any risk whatsoever. They applied the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle basically states if something is not 100% safe and that there is a risk you could come to harm, then you shouldn't take the risk. An example of this with a mobile phone would be just not using a mobile phone. If someone were to apply the precautionary principle, they would not buy a mobile phone due to any risk that's involved. This isn't always desirable, however. There is always a risk in everyday life. When we cross the road, for example, when we eat a piece of toast, we could choke, we could get run over, we could trip and hurt ourselves. Generally, we assess the risks and don't always apply the precautionary principle. But sometimes we have to. The greenhouse effect. One of the most misunderstood natural cycles that occurs on the earth. Many people believe the greenhouse effect is man-made, when in fact, it's been here for many years. Its basic principle is that if we took the earth and placed it within a glass greenhouse, the same that you grow your plants in, light would enter the greenhouse during the day and heat up the earth. All the air inside would remain warm, and at night time when the sun goes away, much of that warmth cannot escape because of the glass panels of the greenhouse. The next day when the sun comes up, more light would enter the greenhouse, more warmth would remain trapped. Clearly, this wouldn't be very desirable if the whole surface of the Earth raised its temperature by a few degrees. Whilst it wouldn't affect us too much in some climates such as the UK or indeed on the equator, up in the poles, where it is expected to be cold for most of the time, a raise in a couple of degrees may be enough to melt some ice. It may also be enough to melt some of the permafrost across much of northern Canada and northern Siberia. Should this permafrost melt, or this ice caps melt, the run of water could run into the seas and oceans and therefore the seas and the oceans would fill up deeper. Should they fill and the sea level rise, certain areas would flood. Many people believe this is already happening. Many people forget that the greenhouse effect has been keeping our earth at a stable temperature for many hundreds of thousands of years. The stable temperature is around 21 degrees Celsius. Without it, during the day, sunlight would enter our Earth and would heat us up far too quickly, to around 100 degrees C. The water would literally boil off of the rock. At night, if there was no blanket of CO2 or water vapour or any of our atmosphere, all of the heat would radiate into space as infrared, 
and the Earth would become cold, around minus 200 degrees Celsius. And so the daily fluctuation would be somewhere around 250 degrees Celsius, possibly up to 300 degrees. This could be problematic because water by day would be steam and by night would be ice. Life could never have developed on such a planet. At the minute, lots of heat enters the atmosphere and is trapped so that our temperatures are a lot more stable, a lot more average. If we do add more layers, however, this could become problematic as it would trap more and more heat. It's almost like having a jumper and then adding another jumper and deciding when to stop adding jumpers to the Earth. The Earth will ultimately get too warm and unfortunately the greenhouse effect is not a quick operation to reverse. It may take several tens or hundreds of years to make the greenhouse stabilize back to a previous value. Reasons for the greenhouse effect being bad at the moment rely upon industry. Industry releases much CO2 and water vapor into the air which contributes massively to this greenhouse effect. Campaigners are concerned that if we do not stop this then it will go out of control and we could have a real problem on our hands. There is currently however no definitive scientific proof that humans have damaged our planet in such a way that it is not reversible. We do all however need to be concerned and need to be aware that we have to reduce our carbon output. The greenhouse effect never used to be a problem without humans here. Carbon dioxide in the air was naturally balanced in a cycle known as the carbon cycle, where carbon would naturally be produced by volcanoes and pumped into the air. This atmospheric CO2 would either dissolve into the water of the oceans and the lakes and then be photosynthesized by phytoplankton or sea plants, or it would be fixed by trees and grasses and plants on land. This fixed carbon would generally be consumed by other animals these animals would consume it and respire it, therefore putting the carbon dioxide back into the air. Or if it didn't respire it and the animal died, it could be decomposed and the carbon could be returned to the air from CO2 from the composing bacteria. Alternatively, the animal or plant matter once dead might become part of the earth's soil. The remains could then be trapped within the ground, only to surface again many thousands or millions of years later in a volcanic eruption. Humans have influenced this cycle, however. One large way they have influenced it is by digging carbon up from the ground in the form of gas, oil and coal, commonly known as fossil fuels. Carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere in addition to that naturally produced by animals and by volcanoes. Therefore, the net amount of carbon dioxide in the air has increased dramatically in the last couple of hundred years when humans have started using factories and cars and so forth. This is why campaigners are concerned that the greenhouse effect will become worse as more and more carbon is being taken out of the ground and put into the air as atmospheric CO2 and less and less seems to be fixed. In addition to combustion, clearing forest land such as the rainforest to produce more cattle for farming also decreases the amount of CO2 that can come out of the air. This is minimal but the burning of the wood and of the plant matter does add a lot of CO2 back into the air. The greenhouse effect is also affected by methane which is released by cattle. If left untreated, this cycle with the addition of combustion from humans could create far too much CO2 and therefore produce the problems as already discussed. This cycle would naturally balance itself over a period of time. However, the only way that would happen is if we could take more carbon out of the air and put less in at the same time. A problem humans have to face. This has led to many changes in industry. Power stations, for example. These days, it's a lot more eco-friendly to use nuclear power because of the very, very slight amount of emissions it has. There is no CO2 produced in the fission process, and so it is seen as a greener version of a power station. I hope that helped. Good luck in your exam.